Hi, I'm Sarah Stern. I am a One Mind Rising Star Award from 2021, and I am here with Kafli Draza, who also is a One Mind Rising Star Award from 2013. Um, he has many, many other awards and is a professor at Duke University. Um, but I think we all know that awards are not the most important part. The science is the most important part. So Kaf, could you tell our audience a little bit about what you study in your lab? Yeah, well, well first of all, it's a, an honor and a pleasure to be here with you, Sarah. And congratulations on your award from last year. Thank you. I am a psychiatrist, a neuroscientist, and an engineer. And we are interested in how the brain uses all of those cells, about 200 billion of them, about half of them make electricity. And we're interested in how that electricity is organized to give rise to feelings, emotions, things like happiness, sadness, anger, frustration. And the idea there is if we can understand how that process happens, we can figure out what happens in the case of disease, you know, devastating illnesses, things like schizophrenia or Alzheimer's or autism, so that we can ultimately come up with new treatments and cures. That's awesome. And so if you, how do you think that your training as an engineer and a psychiatrist and a neuroscientist informs how you, um, you know, study these problems and go about your research? Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a 70s kid, right? So I, I grew up um, and suddenly this thing showed up in my house. It was a personal computer, right? And I love taking it apart, putting it back together, you know, understanding how much data could be stored on those little floppy drives that at some point in time were not so floppy anymore. And now the cell phone I carry in my pocket is way more powerful than the computer that I had. It turns out when you're talking about those cells in the brain, the hundred billion of cells, we wouldn't have known how to store or process that much information on the computers that I had when I was growing up. So the engineering has allowed us to create new applications that can store that data and the, the analysis and the skills that come along with engineering training also allows us to figure out how to make sense of it. We take advantage of a set of tools called machine learning, right? With that much data, it's hard to figure out what the pattern is, right? Where the information is. Machine learning or artificial intelligence takes all of that electrical information and essentially organizes it into a picture. And when we're looking at a picture, now we can make sense of that picture and what it's telling us about emotions. That's really interesting. So relating this to your work on brain machine interfaces, how do you think we've progressed in that type of research and where do we still have to go? Yeah, when, when I went to graduate school at the Duke, Duke University, this was after finishing undergraduate engineering, I got fascinated with this area of brain machine interface. So I mentioned I'm a, I'm a 70s baby. So I grew up, I was watching Star Wars, Luke Skywalker's arm got cut off and then he had a robotic arm. And I grew up off of Star Trek, and it was this idea that technology could restore the senses, right? Whether or the feeling or, or the ability for your body to move. And so I went to graduate school to study this idea of neuroprosthetics, this idea that you can move new robotic body parts just by thinking about it. When I got there, I was also part of the medical school, so also getting a, a, a medical training degree. And my first rotation was in the state psychiatric unit. And my first patient was actually a veteran who had schizophrenia. And, and I remember sitting there in the room thinking about the medication history that he'd had, how little they'd done to alleviate his symptoms. He was having suicidal and homicidal thoughts. He was also having difficulties with his history and thinking about the experiences that he'd had that had given him schizophrenia. And I remember thinking, if only we can understand what the brain is doing electrically in these illnesses, maybe we can use technology to ultimately help individuals like that as well. And that's why I sort of got the idea that maybe what we ultimately wanted to create was a new class of tools, things like pacemakers, that you could use to basically reset electrical rhythms in the brain in a way of treating these illnesses. But all of that grew out of my engineering interest and my engineering background. And so I've read that your goal is to cure psychiatric illness and not to treat. What do you think really is the difference between those two things and how can these pacemakers achieve curing versus treating? Yeah, I think a lot of times um, when we think about treating, we want to minimize the things 
that cause people problems, right? And so whether that might be minimizing hallucinations, hearing voices that aren't there, or seeing things that aren't there, or other problems that show up in the case of psychiatric illness. When I think about cure, I think about adding back the full capacity of the individual so that they can achieve all of the things that they were destined to achieve throughout the course of their life. I'm, I myself come from a family that suffered from severe psychiatric illness. One of my parents' siblings, about four out of five of them, have a cure diagnosis of depression or schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. And, and so I think a lot, not just about reducing symptoms, right, but, but restoring those family members back to the full people that they can be in this world, right? When, you, when you've had a, a loved one that's suffering, the idea of just sort of treating and reducing things isn't enough, right? Cure for me means full restoration in a way that you don't have to continually navigate the challenges that come along with the illnesses. And what about prevention? Do you think there's a way to, I guess, find the root causes and prevent rather than cure? Yeah, yeah. I, I always talk about, you know, one of my uh, favorite uh a citizen scientist, uh, Benjamin Franklin, right? and the idea that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Right? I think there's so many areas of medicine that we appreciate if we can get on the front side of illness, um, we can ultimately prevent them from having uh, these illnesses occur in the first place. Right? We think all the time about preventing a heart attack or preventing a stroke. Right. And certainly we have things that can help people after have this stroke, whether it's, you know, rehabilitation or, or other things we can do to help people. But we want to prevent the stroke from happening in this in the first place. I think the same is true of mental illness. One of the experiences I've had throughout my training and the research that I do in my lab is we've come to appreciate that, you know, at the beginning of mental illness, oftentimes there's a major life stressful event. And, and I've talked about this historically throughout the course of my research, whether, you know, it's the loss of a, a loved one or other major life challenges that happen. And I think we've all come to realize in the last two years, right, in the midst of this challenging pandemic, how difficult um, the emergence of a stressful event can be in our own mental health and mental well-being. Certainly, if we haven't experienced that ourselves directly, we've seen it in the, the eyes of our, our children mm -hmm. and our loved ones as well. So in my lab, we think a lot about what is it about these major st stressful events that cause people to transition into um, illness categories, whether it's depression or anxiety. And the idea is if we can understand that process, we might be able to get the, on the front side of it. We think about this question um, in, in a way where we're trying to understand, well, why is it that some of us that are stressed don't develop problems, right? And we call that a biological process, we call that resilience. Mm -hmm. So the idea is if we can predict who's going to have problems with stress, understand what resilience is, we can help people increase their resilience in a way that's ultimately preventative. So that's the goal of what we're working on. And I have to say, in prepping for this interview, I watched some other interviews you've done. And, and in one of them, you my, mentioned... My side hobbies. <laughs> in one of them, you mentioned um, two patients with depression, one who gained weight, one who lost weight. My lab studies feeding, so I was interested in yeah. that. And I was wondering if you think that, you know, by monitoring the activity in the brain, you can also figure out how these symptoms can be so different, even though the disease that we call it is the same, so to speak. Yeah. We engineers love to put things in categories, <laughs> right? And we like to say depressed, not depressed, right? We, we, we love to segment things all the time. But I came to appreciate in my medical training um, that we put things in categories a lot that are fundamentally different, right? And we come to find out that they're different later, right? So certainly if we were sitting here 200 years ago and someone had a fever, we would say, oh my gosh, like put some ice in the bathtub and throw them in, in the ice bath. And then we later came to appreciate that there are things like bacteria that causes fevers, right? And those bacteria might be different. It might um, be uh, in a class that we might call gram positive or gram negative, or it might be a virus that's calling, causing the illness, or you might be having a heat stroke. And all of those things ultimately cause the common fever. In, in our case, what we call depression is probably something that is the fever with many, many different biological causes. And so our idea is if we can understand the differences in the brain and the differences in the firing of the cell, we may be able to ultimately separate the viral illness from the antibacterial illness. And, and I hate to tell all the people with young kids out there, antibacterials don't work, antibiotics don't work if your kid has a virus, right? It works on the bacteria. I tell my friends right. that too, but they don't listen to me. Yeah. 
And so as a psychiatrist, how do you, how is your research informed by the patient perspectives that you hear? I'm not a clinician, yeah. so I don't it, have that benefit. Yeah, it's, it's always an important reminder that I think um, sometimes uh, my colleagues and I miss on the basic science research side, right? And it is that psychiatric illness, by definition, only happens in humans. Right? It is an exclusion criteria in all of our, our manuals that if you are not a human, you, you can't have them. Right, And so we think about how to take the experiences that we gain from talking to patients and hearing about life stories, hearing about families, and then think about how to understand parts of the biology underlying those in our animal models. But at its end, psychiatric illness is a human behavioral dysfunction. Period. And so we always like to make sure as we're doing our basic science work in the lab that it will ultimately apply to humans. I think it both gives us insight about what to study. In this case, I mentioned thinking about stress and resilience, something we see in humans that we can also look in other animal species, but also in when we're deciding how to study the problems and coming up with interventions, always keeping in mind that we want to make sure not only that this helps humans, but that it helps the vast majority of humans. The illnesses that we're talking about are the most debilitating disorders in the world. And so if we come up with treatments that are only going to help the people next door, in our neighborhood, or even in our state, they're ultimately not going to even move the needle in terms of the burden, burden of reducing the burden of illness worldwide. So we're always thinking about making sure that we're helping people and helping people everywhere. And then on the opposite realm, you know, you and I both work with rodents in our laboratories. How do you talk about your research with patients to, I guess, try to help them understand the importance of the research that you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I, I start off with really honest discussions um, with people, um, both about uh, the opportunities that come along with animal research and the limitations. And so the question is, what can we learn um, from, let's say, mice that may be inbred um, that ultimately applies to humans. And, and I think that's a really important question, right? There are lots of things that we've learned throughout the neuroscience space, whether it's in animals like squid <laughs> or in mice or even in flies about how those brain cells, those 100 billion brain cells that create electricity, how they create electricity, right? We've learned things like that they use um, ions, right? So things like potassium and sodium and chloride ions and that that is part of how those cells create the electrical pulses. Well, that is what we say is conserved, or those, some of those properties are very similar in a fly, in a mouse, in a worm, and in a human. And so that allows us to both understand how the biology is working, but also how you can target maybe how the electricity or the, the sodium, the salt ions are moving back and forth across the surface. And it turns out some of that gives us an understanding of um, the things that we use in the clinic. <laughs> Originally, it's things that we use for anesthesia, but ultimately things that can be used to treat pain and psychiatric disorders as well. So I think there's a lot to learn um, in the animal models that apply to humans. Now, I, I will say, I'm a, I, I do research in mice and inbred mice, and I grew up in Washington, D.C. And one day I was walking on the metro, and I looked over the side and I saw a mouse. <laughs> now, when I see a mouse in the lab, you know, you go grab it, you put it back in its cage. And when I saw this mouse, it moved faster than any mouse I'd ever seen in the research lab, like ever. And it, it was a reminder to me that even the animals we're using in the lab are not exactly the same as what those animals would be in the environment, um, in a normal environment. And I think even that is a, is a healthy lesson for us as researchers, that it's not just about the animals, it's about environment as well, right? It's how individual animal and environment come together to shape emotional function. So it's always a reminder for me as I'm thinking about my animals to also be reminded that human beings, and when we think about illness, it's about the environment as well and always keeping that in as we talk about the pandemic, right? A simple change in environment reset many of us and um, help and made us experience devastating challenges with um, psychiatric illness. So I think ex environment is always critical and we working together um, as researchers uh, will give us the opportunity to address that. Yeah, it's interesting because I think people usually look at that as a negative, but maybe we can reframe that yeah. and actually make that into a positive that will give us more information and better information. Yeah, I think much about you know what we are trying to do as scientists and, and clinicians and family members is to help people find hope, 
right? And much of hope is looking into situations that people call negative and helping them see positive in that. So, yeah. Thank you so much for being here today. It's really been a pleasure talking with you. Thanks so much, Sarah. This has been fantastic.